Thank you very much, Tom. And we will now have a roundtable discussion of the importance of measure, measuring, monitoring, and reporting greenhouse gases. It's a, fundament, it's a fundamental part of responding to climate change. We cannot reduce what we have not measured. Knowing our greenhouse gas emissions is the first critical step to making informed decisions regarding reductions. I would like to introduce the chair of this panel, Mr. Pete Granis, who is the commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation for the State of New York. Mr. Granis also chairs the regional greenhouse gas initiative known as REGI, which is the precedent-setting 10-state regional collaborative to reduce greenhouse gases in the power sector. Pete. Well, thank you very much, Linda. Linda Adams, as everybody here knows, is one of the great environmental leaders of the country. And to come all the way from New York to be introduced by her is a great honor for me. And I'm also very honored to be here as part of this uh, great conference very impressive group of uh, talented and committed people. Um, before we delve into the discussion, I think it's important to remember why we're all here. The signs of climate change are all around us. I think they've been referred to many times already. The storms, fires, of course, here and across the globe, uh, droughts, problems that uh, are on the front pages of newspapers uh, throughout the world. This past summer, for the second year in a row, more than 600,000 square miles of Arctic ice cap melted away in just a little over a month, a startling figure that's twice the size of the state of Texas, if anybody wants to do the math. And recently, scientists in Hawaii reported that CO2 levels are up almost 40 percent since the Industrial Revolution and at the highest level for the last 650,000 years. I marvel that anybody can figure out that far back, but those are the figures. The simple fact is we need to dramatically reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide we're here today to collaborate and find workable solutions to this monumental problem. In New York State, we haven't waited for change to come from Washington. And my department is a founding member and a reporter to the Climate Registry, as well as a member of ICAP, the International Climate Action Partnership. And we have forged ahead on our regional greenhouse gas initiative, as Linda mentioned, which recently held the first cap-and-trade carbon auction in the nation's history. And we're hardly alone in this effort. California and many other states and localities have also worked very hard to fill the void left by the Bush administration's inaction. Here in the West, a group of states is planning to have an economy-wide cap-and-trade program up and running by 2012, a very ambitious agenda. In the Midwest, in the heart of coal country, several states have banded together to cap carbon and to emphasize wind power and the use of biofuels. And for all of us who have been working on this crisis in the absence of national leadership from us, from the, from the U.S., November 4th was indeed a very special day. I think the message from Senator-elect Barack Obama is, uh, President-elect Barack Obama is, is very uh, timely. Uh, because of the election of Senator Obama, we will finally have a president who will make climate change a national priority. It's welcome news and a long time coming. We have very high hopes. But whatever the course set by President Obama, we will need to continue to build upon subnational partnerships that have been forged in America and throughout the globe. And this panel today plays a critical role. If we're going to successfully address this climate change crisis, it is essential for countries and regions to both share experiences and knowledge so we can develop common protocols and share standards for reporting greenhouse gas emissions. And most important of all, for states, countries, and regions, they need to trust each other's greenhouse gas emission reporting systems. The success of the Bali Roadmap depends on this work. Again, I'm very honored to be part of this discussion, and I'd like to invite the panel to come up to the stage and introduce Linda Wittenberg, the panel moderator. I think. Well, good morning, everyone, once again. I'm Diane Wittenberg, the Executive Director of the Climate Registry. It's my honor to moderate this panel, and I also have the very difficult task of getting us back on time, so we're off by 
And I'm going to start by introducing my fellow panelists. And the way we're going to work this panel is uh, after I introduce them, I will ask each of them a specific question, and then we'll have a dialogue uh, about the importance of reporting your greenhouse gases and what an important infrastructure move that is. So to introduce my panel, um, next to Commissioner Granis, whom you've already met, is Dr. Adrian Fernandez, who is the president of the National Institute of Ecology in Mexico. To his right is Dr. Guo Shang, who's the Division Chief of International Cooperation, uh, National Development and Reform Commission of the People's Republic of China. Brian Storms on my left, who's the CEO of APX, uh, a very important uh, software company that helps measure greenhouse gas emissions. On my right is Bill Gerwing, the manager of regulatory affairs for BP, uh, which has always been a leader in greenhouse gas emission issues. To his right, Nancy McFadden, a senior vice president of PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric Corporation. And to her right, Annie Petsonk, who is the uh, international counsel for climate change for the environmental group, the uh, Environmental Defense Fund. So thank you, panelists, for joining us. Let me tell you a little bit about the Climate Registry. It underscores the theme that the governor brought up uh, and also Commissioner Granis referred to, that states and regions, and provinces, and many subnational areas around the world have really taken on leadership for climate change. We all have to act, and we can't wait uh, for our federal governments to do so. So the Climate Registry is really an effort by 40 states in the United States, and that's over 90 percent of the population here, and 12 of the 13 Canadian provinces, and the six Mexican border states so far, to band together to establish standards for reporting greenhouse gas emissions so that in any policies that we adopt serially, together, separately, we can trust one another's numbers, and we don't have to discount and say, I don't like the way you measured this. Uh, I want to measure it a different way. And then companies are reporting to these standards voluntarily that we've set because they don't want one state asking them to report their refinery emissions one way, another state a different way, a different country a, another way. So there's a, a community of interest in the climate registry. We've set these best practices for accounting standards, and then we're also supporting mandatory reporting for the states and for the regions and the provinces as they report into a single database um, so we know when various policies are established by the states and provinces and regions and the federal government, whether they've been successful or not, where have we started, and how has that ended up. So in this very basic, boring, deep, but necessary field of reporting greenhouse gases, China has been working very hard on calculating its vast resources and what the emissions are that it has to start from uh, as it looks at policies to reduce them. And I'd like, Dr. Liu, for you to talk um, a little bit about what you're doing in measuring China's emissions, the opportunities you, you see, and the challenges you're facing. Thank you, Diane. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, China did on this uh, very important regard. Uh, GHG, as everybody knows, that GHG reporting is very, very important. It is the foundation for international cooperation to addressing the, the, cl the climate change. Uh, you know, uh, but uh, talking about uh, reporting, what China did and China is doing is that, uh, according to the requirement of the United Nations uh, uh, Convention on Climate Change, China. Uh, as well as other parties, they need to submit a national communication, which includes a very important content is that the uh, emission inventory. Okay. However, to China, as well as the other developing countries, it is not easy at all. Uh, for example, the first 
the National Communication was conducted uh, 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 several years ago. I remember that's uh, four years ago. Uh, this calculates the annual emission levels uh, for the year of 1994 only. After that, for China as well as other developing countries, uh, we have not, you know, accurate figures. Although, you know, people talk about which country, including China, the, how much they emitted. But uh, we have no accurate figures. Uh, this year, from this year, China is uh, conducting a program. This is uh, to, uh, according to the requirement to conduct a second time national communication, uh, including the, in, uh, the emission inventory. And this time, according to the requirement of the, uh, the convention, that China not only to conduct the, the mandatory uh, the emission the estimation on three types of uh, greenhouse gases, that is the CO2, N2O, and uh, methane. But also, China will conduct more, you know, the, the estimates on other three types of uh, GHGs, that is the HFC, hydrofluorocarbon, the perfluorocarbon, and uh, S, uh, F6. And also, this is the first ever time that China will include the Hong Kong and Macau for the national community inventory. And this will take three years to conduct this, the, the whole program. And with the support of the UNFCCC, with the financial support from the GEF, the Global Environmental Facility. So uh, this give an example uh, that what China is doing regarding this, uh, uh, to reporting the, the emission of the national level. And uh, the difficulty and challenge to China is that uh, we really take uh, 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 a lot of, uh, you know, the uh, finance and the manpower and uh, experience to do that. So we are very interested to learn from this, uh, at this conference, uh, what you are doing. I mean, from the California, from the other, you know, areas all over the world. Uh, your experience, uh, what you did, will be very valuable for China, for us, to learn in the future and to improve our work and to cooperate with others. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure there's plenty of people in this audience willing to give you advice and expertise. I'd like to ask our other uh, international panelists now, Dr. Fernandez, uh, about Mexico's experience with greenhouse gas reporting. Mexico's had a voluntary registry for its large companies for many years now. And could you tell us a little bit about that registry and some of the other policies you're implementing to reduce greenhouse gases and how you're going to know if they're successful? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me, before I answer the question, to, to thank the organizers and in particular the governor of California for the kind invitation to the Mexican government to participate in such an important meeting. Now, uh, regarding inventories, uh, Mexico has uh, conducted for a number of years uh, several works uh, around inventories. As you mentioned, we participate uh, in the, what we call the Greenhouse Protocol. This is a voluntary registry where we have uh, almost uh, 40 of the largest industries in Mexico. You might think this is a very small number, but these industries account or contribute with more than 80% of our emissions from this sector. Uh, this is a voluntarily instrument that we developed with the support of institutions such as WRI and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Now, um, there's another interesting uh, tool that we are just beginning. Um, you are familiar with the toxic release inventory in the U.S. Well, we call it Pollutant Release and Transfer Registry, and we decided to add greenhouse gases to that mandatory request for industries. So for a large number of industries, we are now um, developing capacity. We are working with them together so that more and more industries are able to develop their own inventories. And as you know, this is a first step to identify opportunities for energy efficiency, reduction in the use of fuels, and so on. Now, um, just like in China, as Dr. Liu clearly uh, mentioned, uh, Mexico has been working within the framework of the Climate Convention, and we have the obligation 
of prepared national greenhouse gases inventories as well as national communications. Uh, we uh, already submitted our third national communication and hopefully we will be submitting our fourth next year in Copenhagen. Now, the reason why I mention the national communications is because one of the pillars of this effort is precisely the national greenhouse gases inventory. And as Dr. Liu said, it uh, takes a lot of energy, a lot of personnel, a lot of money, and uh, it's uh, very important to recognize the need to build capacity, human capacity, institutional capacity, so we shouldn't disregard uh, this important aspect. So once a country has the will to actively participate, then we all should work together to help that country to develop capacity so that their participation is more meaningful. And uh, to finish my, my comment, uh, let me uh, mention that uh, Mexico is preparing at the moment what we call the national uh, special plan for climate change. And we are lucky enough that uh, President uh, Felipe Calderón is a truly a, a great believer of climate change, a champion of climate change, and he has made a priority this topic in his administration. So next year, early next year, uh, he will be presenting to the international community Mexico's special plan on climate change that includes a, a series of specific measures and policies to reduce emissions. So this will be the package that Mexico will put on the table as part of our fair contribution to combat climate change. And we will be um, also putting on the table a series of options that we believe are cost-effective in terms of mitigation that will be happy to go forward with the support of international community. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Well, we've heard two perspectives from international governments, and I'd like to turn to the private sector now and ask Nancy McFadden from PG&E. You, these two gentlemen have been talking about their inventories at the country level, while PG&E, which is a big emitter, has been measuring its own greenhouse gases and reporting these rigorously and voluntarily for quite a while, as well as I understand there's a Mexican connection with one of the new climate programs that you're doing. So could you talk a little bit about why you have voluntarily reported your greenhouse gases, the value you've gotten from that, and kind of how that fits with national inventories and, and our neighbor to the south, Mexico? Absolutely. Thank you, Diane. And I, too, want to preface my answer with uh, congratulations to our governor, our leader on this fight here in California and, and his fellow governors who are hosting this uh, extraordinary assemblage of people from across the world to talk about the nuts and bolts of this very important issue, combating climate change. And I'm honored to be on this distinguished panel. And it is really fitting that this is the opening panel to talk about something that sounds a little boring, reporting protocols and inventories, but is absolutely, as has been said, the foundation of how we get to the solution and how we figure out how we reduce those emissions. We've got to understand what our emissions are first before we can have any idea where you start by reducing them. So back in 2003, before there was here in California an AB 32, a Global Warming Act, uh, the California Climate Action Registry began and PG&E was one of a very small number of companies that joined to voluntarily compute and inventory its carbon emissions and report them publicly and submit them to a rigorous protocol and a rigorous examination so that it wasn't just PG&E saying this is what we think our carbon emissions are, but you had an outside respected entity saying this is how you measure them and yes, this is what your carbon emissions profile or inventory are. I wasn't at PG&E in 2003 when the company made that decision, but it was a, a decision of foresight because people saw that mandatory reporting was on the horizon. People saw that it was the obligation of a utility, which is a large emitter, but an obligation to be a leader 
and to identify the problem and then start to f- try and figure out some solutions. And so people at PG&E said we're going to be a founding member of the California Climate Action Registry, and then more recently we were a founding member of the Climate Registry, which Diane was one of those people with foresight back in the early 2000s that really started this whole process of having inventory of carbon emissions. It has turned out to be, for the company, not only a way for us to understand our carbon profile so we can start to attack it and lower it, but it has also had an advantage for our customers and for cities across California. Because as we understand the carbon profile of the energy we provide, our customers start to begin to understand the carbon associated with the energy they use. And the cities around our service territory start to understand the carbon profile of the energy that they use. So it has an effect not just for us as a company, but a widespread effect amongst our customers and throughout the state of California. And why is that important? Because then we as a utility and our customers can see Maybe you start using a little less energy, and although this is about carbon reductions and carbon, uh, carbon inventory, I always have to mention energy efficiency in whatever public event I'm at. And so having a carbon inventory and understand how much carbon you produce by using energy allows you to understand the importance of using less energy. The next thing that understanding your carbon profile allows you to do is figure out how you want to reduce it in other ways. And one of the things that we have done is, with our customers, developed a program called Climate Smart, which allows our customers to see, after they use energy efficiency to reduce their energy usage, allows them to understand what's remaining in terms of their carbon profile, the carbon emissions associated with their energy usage. And they can participate in a voluntary program that invests in carbon reduction projects across the state, and eventually, we hope, in Mexico, which is why we were so honored to sign on to the um, Memorandum of Understanding with the state of California and six border states and the Climate Action Registry and PG&E to be able to do some some cross-border emissions projects. But our customers are, allow, are able to offset their energy usage and, and eventually make it car, excuse me, carbon neutral. Mm-hmm. So starting with inventorying and understanding what your carbon profile is really opens the door to solving the problem and understanding how you can reduce your emissions, which is what we're all about here in these two days. Thanks, Nancy. You know, there were many companies that volunteered to be on this panel this morning, and we chose companies, as I said, that have had a long-time leadership reputation in the area of greenhouse gases, and BP certainly fits in that cadre of companies. Um, Bill, you were very early on at BP. You not only measured and reported your greenhouse gas emissions. You did internal cap-and-trade programs. You've stepped out for mandatory programs at the federal level when only a few companies uh, did so. What's kind of the current view of these issues at BP, and what's next, do you see? Sure. Uh, Thanks, Diane. And uh, it's great to be uh, in California today. California is uh, very important to BP. It's important to this country and the rest of the world. And I just want to thank the governor and his staff for inviting BP to, to be a part of this uh, uh, panel today. Um, you know, I've been with the company uh, for, for a long time, 26 years. And the, we, we first came out 11 years ago to talk about climate change and the role of the warming planet in precautionary action uh, before it was pu- uh, publicly or politically popular. Um, many people say we, we left the church with our industry, uh, a common quote. But I, I think it's important to kind of step back and then just look at uh, why, why we've done that, why we did that, why we continue to believe that it's an important issue to address. And what I'd like to do is start with just some of our, our kind of high-level views, and then I'll, I'll work that back into the, the reason for uh, our involvement with your organizations over the years uh, for, to... Uh, advance the registries. 
Uh, in general, our views on climate change haven't, at the, t- at the top of the uh, high-level messages, haven't changed significantly. There's a lot of details that have changed over the last 11 years that uh, me and my staff and many others in the audience here from BP would be love to, to talk to you about. But we believe, uh, first, that a single mandatory national entity-wide emission registry is at the heart of any program. Um, you can't... You can't advance uh, climate focus without knowing what you're focusing on. Um, You have to measure and act on those measurements. Uh, Second, a national cap on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, uh, We believe that we uh, continue to work cooperatively with states and regions who want to proceed with with systems in the absence of a, a federal program. Uh, but at the end, we will need a national program. A patchwork of state-by-state um, programs is not a sustainable way of, of, of making climate part of this nation's focus. Third, trading. Uh, we believe that trading is one of the many market mechanisms that needs to be a part of a, of a, cap, of a, of, of a program, uh, both at a multi-state and national level. And uh, last, a uh, broad suite of pol- policies to advance technology. Uh, the cap-and-trade program in itself uh, uh, will not advance technology at a quick enough pace. We're going to need other incentives to advance technologies, wind, solar, hydrogen power, uh, carbon capture, sequestration, geothermal, uh, to really meet our goals, uh, both, both in the midterm and, and uh, long term. Um, Diane, as you know, we were a a charter member of the California Climate Action Registry. Uh, Bob Malone sat on your board uh, from BP. And uh, I think the statement that we we used back then is appropriate for today. Um, You can't manage what you don't measure. And what we've learned over the last many years, uh, uh, several with your organizations, is that uh, reporting can be difficult. Um, but uh, when you get the right minds in a room together, you can uh, find the right uh, methodologies, protocols, and calculation methods so that we'll have a uniform uh, platform to work from. And I think that work has been very important for us. It was, it was eye-opening for us from a California experience. Um, and I know my team continues to work with your, your new staff. Um, I just personally want to thank you for your leadership and vision to make uh, the California Climate Action Registry a a success. Thanks, Bill. Um, uh, Finally, I think, um, well, you know what, I should, I'm getting, I'm getting the signal here that my time's up, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm going to pass. I wanted him to end on a high note if he was complimenting. (laughs) That was a good good way to say it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Annie Petzonk, who really has an international perspective. And, and I'd like you, Annie, to kind of address how we kind of weave all this together. Bill referred to we don't want a patchwork. We don't want a patchwork whether, whether that's states and provinces. We don't want a patchwork whether it's countries. And yet we all want to measure and have a common denominator from where we start with on climate policies. So have you you've been thinking about that? Just a little bit, Diane. Thanks. Uh, When California, under the leadership of Governor Schwarzenegger, leaders like Fran Pavley and Fabian Nunez and other assembly leaders, and in partnership with states and provinces across North America, established the cap-and-trade framework, uh, you've taken the step to create one of the largest new markets for anything ever. In doing so... You have the ability, states and and governments that establish these new markets, have the ability to set the requirements for who will get access to your carbon market. And in that way, by setting the requirements for uh, uh, tradability of foreign tons coming into your market, you can stimulate an investor search for quality here and around the world that will invite other nations and states to join you. You've identified, and the speakers here have focused on, 
a couple of the key elements, but I just want to highlight uh, the three elements that we see as crucial. Clear mandatory caps on total emissions. That's not emissions per unit of product produced or per kilowatt of hour of energy uh, uh, transmitted. That's caps on total emissions because that's what the environment cares about. Second, transparent reporting systems, the transparency of those systems is what can enable over time carbon markets to communicate with each other. If the systems are not transparent, investors will shy away from investments in those places precisely because they will not know if the reductions they finance in one place will be creditable in the market that you are creating. Uh, the third element is verification and accountability. What are the consequences if someone emits more than their allowable level? There has to be some accounting uh, for that. And by simply including those three elements, uh, you're setting a foundation for weaving together that patchwork. I don't think the patchwork is going to be uh, uh, it, it, going to move immediately to a global framework. Certainly the nations in Poznan and in Copenhagen will be working to get that global framework as soon as possible and will be asking nations to participate. But what we learned from uh, the past 10 years is that each state and each nation has its process for deciding when and on what terms it's going to join up with the international effort. And so by establishing these three requirements clearly at the state level and at the federal level, uh, you, you set a framework that can provide a foundation in the future for weaving together uh, that patchwork. I want to take just a few minutes, a few seconds really, to address one further element that's going to be discussed later today and tomorrow uh, and that's receiving quite a bit of attention. And that is, what are the requirements that you set for emission reductions coming into your system in places that don't already have caps on emissions? We have seen that globally we've got to reduce total emissions in the world in a very short time frame if we're going to combat climate change successfully. That means that in countries where emissions are rising rapidly, if we simply say, okay, someone who does a project in that country that reduces emissions below what would have happened anyway and transfers that to California or to an industrialized country so that they can increase emissions along what would have happened anyway is not going to result in reducing global emissions. We've got to do better than that. And the developments that you're considering here in California, reaching out to forest states and forest nations, challenging them to look at their total emissions from deforestation, uh, similarly reaching out to the energy sectors in countries where emissions are rising rapidly, asking them to look at their total absolute emissions and inviting them to seek emissions reductions across the board, that is a very powerful tool in terms of reporting that you can put uh, into the national and international framework. It's a real leadership step, and we congratulate you for it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. You know, the conversation has inevitably been drifting toward carbon markets on this reporting panel because in the end, if you're reducing something, it becomes more precious, it's a commodity, and there's going to be a market for it. And Brian Storms has spent a lot of time thinking about market structure for carbon, what has to happen to make it successful, how do you counteract people who say, well, I meant to reduce carbon, and I'm trying, and I think I should get credit for that, versus, you know, let's be more rigorous about it. So, Brian, could you give us some thoughts about carbon market structure and definitions of success in that? Sure. Well, as my fellow panelists have done, I'd also like to recognize the state of California and their leadership, and, and certainly Governor Schwarzenegger and his staff for putting this conference together. We uh, indeed have a front row seat to what's happening here in California. Just as a point of reference, APX, a company that many of you, I'm sure, are not familiar with, provides all the infrastructure and support underlying the California registry. 
as well as all the major voluntary carbon registries around the world. And we also support um, all of the renewable markets here in the United States on a state-by-state basis. So my remarks are based on the experience that we've had in both uh, the carbon and the renewable markets here in the United States. I I'll also start by saying I agree with everything that Annie said. Um, she captured it as, as well as anyone, if not better, that I've heard speak about what's necessary for the future. So um, an extraordinary level of understanding, which is no surprise. But, but uh, we agree with everything that was said just a few moments ago. The, um, certainly the cap and trade, the notion of cap and trade is going to go from a theory to reality here pretty soon. I don't, I don't know if any of us know exactly when, but certainly within the next few years, cap and trade, based on the comments we heard just a few moments ago, will become a reality. And it's our view, and I'm sure many others, that it still is the most powerful force for deploying capital to fund meaningful climate solutions, um, just as importantly rewarding innovation, which is critical in this marketplace, and uh, I guess lastly, and, and the single most important thing, eliminating um, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So that's what it's all about. We, um, we've heard, we've seen, we've read from so many different parts of the world uh, rec uh, reports on how large the carbon markets could become. Uh, the estimates range from a trillion to two or three trillion dollars three, four, five years from now, arguably the largest commodity market in the world if that were to occur. So these are rather significant markets and one of the only, if only, globally integrated commodity that I can think of as well. So uh, there's a lot to do in market structure to assure that these markets uh, take on that scale and ultimately affect the positive changes that we're all so interested in, in seeing take place. You have to think back just a, the last several months to, to see what's happened in the financial markets that's affected everybody in this room and indeed everybody around the world to appreciate more than ever how this market, this new market for environmental commodities broadly, has to take shape for it to have a real legitimate chance of, um, of solving the issues that we're discussing. Um, clearly, transparency that's been mentioned by everyone is, is underlying all of the issues. For the public and for the regulatory community to have confidence in these markets, transparency underlines everything that we're talking about. Having the clear tracking systems, like some of the systems that we build and others in the marketplace, to be able to, to verify these assets, to be able to uh, defend and support the protocols that are being built in the marketplace is a critical part of it. Maybe the most important part of the carbon markets are the oversight responsibilities. There's a tremendous amount of discussion in Washington today about how we're going to continue to regulate the traditional financial markets like securities and commodities in the view of what's happened here in the last several months and now add carbon and renewable energy to that list. How are we going to regulate these markets? Who is going to regulate these markets? So um, for us to move into a, a robust market here in the U.S. alone, never mind a globally integrated marketplace, uh, these oversight capabilities are extraordinarily important. And then I could spend an hour, which I'm certainly not going to do today, going down all the various risks that we could identify from project risk to credit risk to political risk to all sorts of market risks that have to be addressed and are being addressed today to bring this to a legitimate trading marketplace, which at the end of the day is what is going to happen under a cap and trade regime. So we're delighted to be a part of the discussion. As you said, Diane, we, we, we think about this uh, 24 by 7 and happy to respond to uh, any questions on that subject as we progress. So thank you. Thank you, Brian. So you've heard from everybody on the panel. I'm going to ask Commissioner Granis. I'm just highlighting this for you, and, and then the other panelists to respond as well. So the key points that have been made by the panelists have to do with more technical expertise and help to get our knowledge of what our own emissions baselines are, helping the public understand its own carbon emissions through the energy it uses, the need for mandatory programs, the need for harmonizing internationally. And so I'd like the, comment, the panel to comment on those if they have anything more to say. I've seen a few note takers here. Uh, Commissioner Granis. Uh, did the panel say what you expected, and what were your thoughts? It, it did. It, so many of the issues we were, were talked about uh, just in the last few minutes were things that we've been wrestling with for the last five years and, and pulling together our Reggie uh, model in the Northeast and launching our first uh, successful cap-and-trade auction several months ago. So these are issues that obviously have to transcend the 10 Northeastern states and Midwest and Mid-Atlantic Mid states and pull together. I guess I'm most concerned about how 
we eventually reconcile what we have done with what the Western states are doing and the Southern states are doing and the progressive governors that are represented here and their states are doing, that uh, as we proceed with this patchwork, which I see continuing for several more years until we get a national program, is to make sure that this work then transcends without any uh, difficulty into a national program without leaving anybody behind. So I think this is very impressive to what's going on. We've done so much and there's so much more to do but to make sure that what we do makes sense from a national perspective, which is where my concern comes from, from New York and from my governor, Governor Patterson, has been very outspoken on this and, and the need for reconciling what our work does uh, and has done uh, with the work going on around the country and eventually around the globe. So to the three public officials at that end of the table, let me follow up and, and say that we've talked about using GHG data as a basis for cap and trade, but what other policies do you see a year, each of your jurisdictions might implement um, and track? Uh, we're not going to get to our 80 percent reduction that President-elect Obama talked about with just one uh, policy. We need a basket. So what, what's kind of on your wish list or favorite thing you'd like to do in terms of reducing carbon emissions in your countries or states? Who would like to start? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay, Dr. Liu? <clears throat> okay, uh, to, for China, uh, this will be the, uh, very early, the very early stage. Still, you know, means uh, 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 for China there's a long way to go. So the first step is uh, to have a very accurate, you know, the, the, the figure on the emission uh, of GHGs, both at the country level and also at the, the local level and also for different sectors, even for different installations. Uh, there will have be a lot of work to do, especially for, the, for China, as such a big size of the economy and such a big size of the country. Uh, this is uh, going to be not easy at all. And, uh, but uh, the, the, the country, is uh, doing our best to push forward from that. Take the example of the, the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism. Uh, China, uh, a few years ago, uh, in, uh, that's about three, more than three years ago, when the Kyoto Protocol entered into force, at that time it's uh, both from the capacity and from the, the capability and the experience. It's uh, all you know, fell behind compared to other major developing countries, I mean China. But now, after uh, several years of uh, hard work, China has become uh, one of the most important uh, developing countries to cooperate with uh, developing countries to uh, implement the CDM projects in the world. And this, uh, one of the basis is, uh, again, is, uh, uh, is uh, accurate, you know, the monitoring reporting system for each at the project basis cooperation. So, Again, there's a, it's a long way to go. And in this process, we're really looking forward to a, a support and cooperation with other developed countries like U.S., like from Europe, uh, even for other de developing countries. We would like to cooperate with you. We would like to learn from you uh, to, to introduce such very advanced uh, systems and uh, experience also, uh, the management systems to help us to increase our capability, the capacity. Interesting. So, so Dr. Liu refers to the CDM, the, the development mechanism under Kyoto, for offset projects, in other words, reductions that are not under a cap. And uh, China provides many of those projects uh, to the other signers of the Kyoto Treaty, and Mexico does as well. So, Dr. Fernandez, uh, do you want to talk a little bit, since Dr. Liu brought it up, about CDM projects and your experience and s sort of how measuring and monitoring fits in, but also just the kinds of projects you think have the most integrity? Well, uh, this is a very broad issue, uh, but what I see clearly is that, again, uh, what the single most important first step is to measure whether you're preparing a uh, uh, 
a proposal for the CDM or you are uh, building your baselines on what will happen if you do nothing, so a uh, business as usual scenario, uh, whether you are assessing the opportunities for energy efficiency, saving fuel, uh, switching to renewables, the first step is to measure. So and, um, in that regard, um, we are trying to build a two-tier strategy. Uh, I already mentioned the efforts from the top to the bottom, and that has to do with the national inventories. But to work on specific projects or even specific sectors, it is very important to work from the bottom to the top. So you really have to go to the details so that you can uh, really use comparable methodology, use the same emission factors, uh, provide transparency, as has already been mentioned. So, um, and uh, to that aim, we are working with the local governments. Uh, uh, besides our national plan for climate change, we are beginning a very good partnership with almost every single state in Mexico so that we develop together what we call a statewide action plan. And uh, we should remember also that mitigation is one pillar that we need for uh, fighting climate change. But local authorities and national governments that are equally or even more interested about adaptation so and, uh, for both adaptation and mitigation, uh, again, uh, you have to go first to the details, you have to build capacity, you have to look for the local experts and uh, to get them involved. And you have to talk to them in terms of opportunities. There is so much that could be done before you, you, you should start getting worried about paying the bill. So there are so many hang, low-hanging fruits, uh, no regrets policies, and in countries like Mexico, we are beginning to acknowledge that. So we believe there's a large number of policies, measures, programs that we uh, can implement in the next few years before we go into the more difficult areas or really pushing down our energy intensity. We can achieve lower energy intensity very soon, very cheaply. And uh, we will soon, um, and after that, uh, with the support of others, through the CDM or through a green fund or any other mechanism, we can go even further uh, down. So um, again, to finish my comment, there is a, a clear need to develop the uh, technical capacity to measure emissions, to calculate uh, uh, your emissions either from sector to sector or even more for specific projects. Thank you. Um, I have to say our experience at the Climate Registry, to your point about opportunities abound, is that many companies that report their emissions are, are doing so partly as an analytical tool to see when legislation is proposed, will this legislation hurt them or can they manage to operate within, within whatever law is going to be passed. And many of them find they're pleasantly surprised that, in fact, there's opportunities to reduce at low cost um, that we haven't even started to avail ourselves of in, in many cases. And, and sort of while I'm at that end of the table, Commissioner Granis, do you want to talk about offsets a little bit in terms of the Reggie? Because uh, you, the mini CDM approach you have there. And, uh, it, it is indeed a Reggie. mini CDM approach. We have a very limited uh, array of offset options that we will accept. Uh, obviously concerned about some of the issues that were talked about here, verification, uh, the, the vitality of these projects in other uh, jurisdictions and whether or not they truly meet the offset standards. So we have a very limited, I think there are only five categories of offsets that we accept or will accept at this point in Reggie. Clearly it's up to the decisions of the ten states to whether, uh, whether or not we expand that list. Um, but it is, uh, we, we are, have been leery just because of the same issues that you were talking about here on, on just being able to be assured that we are actually getting back what we intend to when we provide for offset use in, uh, by the power sectors in, in our 10 states. Other panelists, do you have comments you want to make on this? Annie, did you? Sure, thank you. I was uh, very interested to hear in particular uh, Adrian Fernandez's remarks about uh, different incentive approaches that can help finance the transition from the project by project rather cumbersome mechanism uh, in Kyoto where you have to prove that you're reducing emissions below what would have happened anyway. That's a difficult proof to make. Um, I always tell my husband when I, I want another 
slice of cake for dessert that I'm uh, eating less cake than would have happened anyway. Um, so it's, it's difficult to, to prove what would have happened anyway, uh, and it's expensive to prove it in, in the context of climate projects. Um, we're, we noted with interest um, the effort to develop green funds to finance a more rapid transition to low-carbon technologies. That's a challenge. Last time I read the newspaper here in California, uh, you were facing some budgetary challenges, and certainly those budgetary challenges uh, are faced at the federal level as well. So where is the funding going to come from to support capacity building, the green funds to finance the rapid transition to a low-carbon technology? Uh, We think that the primary source of funding will be the carbon market and that it's crucial uh, in terms of reporting and verification to offer those states and nations that are willing to uh, commit to carbon limits early uh, the opportunity to uh, achieve rewards for doing so. We call that the clear path, and we're happy during the break to discuss that further with anyone who's interested. Thank you. Nancy, do you have any concluding remarks? Um, we're on that clear path. <laughs> uh, I, a, a simple point that I think is, is worth stating, which is as we get more practice on reporting our emissions, verifying our emissions, having uh, outside verifiers, I think that we will be able to have the tools to design and ultimately have a successful cap-and-trade program. And I think that is why the early efforts of states like California and New York and nations like Mexico and China to focus on reporting early so when we get to the point, finally, of having a real cap-and-trade program, which we all agree we need desperately, I think we'll have worked out a lot of the kinks and we'll have a better designed program because of these early efforts. Uh, yeah, I just want to make a quick comment on, on the uh, offset piece. And, uh, you know, I have a simple mind, and a ton is a ton. And what, what does that mean? It means let's not make barriers so difficult that you can't actually get low-cost reductions, because if we do that, it just drives up the cost of the program. And, I, I, you know, we clearly need verifiable, real reductions, but we have to remi- remind ourselves at the end of the day that a ton is a ton. Thanks, Bill. Brian? I would just, that was a perfect way for me to end because I, I think Bill hit a very important point. Uh, it's a critical part of this, but also, Pete, the comments you made, I think, are, are very telling because his, his comment was at this stage of the market, there are five, I think you said five, that you feel comfortable with, um, and that's probably right at this stage of the market. So we have, uh, we have time, uh, and we have the, the willingness, I think, as a, as a market to be certain that we can take advantage of the marketplace, as Bill just uh, articulated, because we're going to need to have ultimately the credibility in these systems across the U.S. and indeed around the world so that Pete and others can feel very confident that, in this case, an offset or a, as a what's the word you like to use, project, a carbon reduction project, not offset, is, um, is absolutely a vital part of this whole carbon management chain. So I think we're right on the money with that. Including uh, comment, Dr. Liu? No, no Dr. No Fernandez? Thanks. Anything in conclusion? Well, I, I find that it's sort of remarkable as someone who's been making the rounds of carbon conferences and this being an especially important event internationally. It used to be sort of the, the streets are paved with gold in terms of carbon trading and, you know, it's a wonderful new world out there. And, and the fact that it's getting more serious-minded of let's make it work and make it worth, work with integrity and we have to get these reductions and we have to look at the technology to do it is really, a, I, I think, a, a very important step forward. I'm proud to be, to be part of it. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Granis for concluding remarks. Well, I, I want to thank you, uh... Diane for, and, and the panel. It's been very, very interesting. Obviously, this is the opening salvo of a very important dialogue that will result uh, tomorrow, I hope, in a cooperative summit declaration on climate solutions that we hope will be uh, helpful to our national uh, colleagues and international partners as they struggle with this very important issue. Uh, I was going to make a joke about uh, this being s- such a California-type event. Um, we don't have productions like this in New York. Um, But uh, 
those of you who don't know, I was in politics for 30 years before I got my current job, and I used to go to senior centers all the time. And when you ate at 11.15, it wasn't — lunch was, it was setting up for the blue plate special later in the afternoon. But uh, it's a very early lunch. But I think that's uh, — I think we're going to obviously set up for a break for uh, brunch, if not lunch. And uh, I guess Linda is going to uh, conclude. But I just want to say how, how appreciative I am to panelists for their contributions and uh, hope everybody got uh, something out of this. And uh, as we build on this uh, opening panel, work uh, later on in the day and tomorrow. Um, I hope you will all take the chance to talk to us and we will get a chance to talk to many of you about what we've been doing and uh, what our interests and priorities are and you'll let us know the same. So I want to thank you all very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Pete and Diane and all our distinguished panelists, uh, especially uh, Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Liu. And you all did a fabulous job. I had, I w had no idea that this would be so interesting, but really you, you, you did a great job making this a really interesting